I'm Cinder Niemela, and along with Charlotte Gilmano, welcome to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. I believe the most powerful gifts you can give yourself is time to reflect on your talents and experience, and then have the wisdom to act with confidence and grace. This podcast is for entrepreneurs, leaders, and individuals who want to thrive in work and life. Your journey to being connected and inspired by the world around you starts right now. Hi, my guest today is Paul Breloff. He'll be joining us from Mumbai, India. Paul is the co-founder and CEO of Shortlist. Shortlist is a recruiting technology startup and it's transforming how talent meets opportunity in emerging markets. With a law degree from Yale and experience in microfinance and impact investing globally, Paul has advised major corporations on access to finance issues globally. Working across India and Kenya, Paul and his co-founder have grown shortlist to 60 full-time employees in just two and a half years. Shortlist is on a mission to unlock professional potential, and it does this by combining technology, data, and a human touch to source and screen great job seekers for growing purposeful companies across India and East Africa. You will find Paul's bio and resources mentioned during our interview at inspiredwisdom.us slash podcast. Welcome to the call. Thank you, Cinder. It's great to be here. Oh, it's really great to meet you. Paul, you live in Mumbai, India, um, and yet you don't seem to have an Indian accent. So where did you grow up? Um, I'm working on my Indian accent, but it hasn't come through yet. I grew up in Western New York, uh, actually a small town called Lockport, New York, that is near Buffalo and, and Niagara Falls, and actually didn't leave the country until uh, my, uh, I guess my tw- 22nd year of life. So spent spent the first 21 years focused very much on the U.S. before the explosion of curiosity uh, I seemed to experience that, that made me start to want to travel and explore more of the world and experience uh, other places. Oh, interesting. So you had already finished college and had you finished law school by the time you were 22? No, I was just finishing college. In fact, my first trip out of the country uh, after a brief stopover in Europe was to Pakistan. So South Asia seemed to have gotten into my blood very early. A group of college friends and I uh, had a great uh, college friend who lived in Pakistan and invited us to stay with him and his family and before uh, and that felt like a really unique, possibly once in a lifetime experience. And so uh, flew over. I remember it uh, being a heat that I had never experienced, a, a color uh, and sense, uh, smell and, and, and sights that I had never seen before. And I think it was one of the many early experiences that made me realize the world's a lot bigger than the corner of the U.S. I had gotten to know and made me a lot curious, a lot more curious about what else was out there. Mm. What did you think you were going to do with your life when you were 21, 22? Still, to this day, I'm still trying to figure out what I will do with my life writ large. But at 21, 22, I think I had pretty much no idea. Um, I think it was a point in in life where, uh, and I think this went on for for many years post-college, of trying to find the best place for me to, to slot in that would feel meaningful, that would get me excited, that would, would, would feel like it was utilizing my talents, but also uh, something I enjoyed doing. At that moment, I was graduating as a philosophy and psychology major and was very interested intellectually in those topics, um, was weighing a lot of the normal corporate things that people were considering and weighing coming out of a Northeastern liberal arts college. I went to Amherst College in Massachusetts. So at that time was thinking more short term, what's a job that's going to let me be a young professional, put on uh, adult work clothes and go into an office each day and experience a job and pay my bills and have an apartment and and do all these adult things uh, I was excited about. 
And beyond that, I don't know if I was as strategic as I probably should have been. So my first job out of college was actually in advertising. But I would be lying if I told you I thought at age 21 or 22 that advertising would be what I did for the rest of my life. I think at that point, it was more of a, a stopover. And frankly, I can go into more detail. I, I, I really did enjoy it, even though uh, after some time there, realized it wasn't where I wanted to spend a long, long stretch of my career. Mm. So after your stint in uh, Pakistan or your visit to Pakistan, did you come right back to the U.S. or did you continue to travel? Yeah, that was a relatively short trip before uh, work started. Uh, so it mm. was probably only, uh, I believe, a two-week trip to Pakistan. Uh, my friends and I went back to uh, Europe and spent some time uh, in Italy and uh, France uh, before returning home. For me, in some ways, uh, particularly the Europe part was the traditional uh, backpack or rite of passage trip that a lot of people do with the Eurail passes and pensions and, and all of that sort of thing. But for me, it was it was a hugely eye-opening experience and one that uh, I think did fuel a lot of the global interest that followed. What did you especially like about Europe? You know, that, that those memories are starting to fade, I, I'm sad to say, into the re recesses of the past. I think there was something, as I think back now, there was something intoxicating about not understanding what the heck was going on around, on around you. And I think mm. that sense of mystery and lack of clarity uh, and lack of understanding is still something I enjoy now. And it, it kind of adds a layer of challenge to the day-to-day -day navigation of the universe that I find uh, interesting and fun. At least the India I experience is, is primarily English speaking, and it's not as much a language mystery that I face on a regular basis now. It's, it's still such a different uh, cultural place, and there are so many things happening at all times that I don't totally understand. Um, that it's one of the things I, I really enjoy in Europe at that time, um, the simple fact that people were speaking Italian and French and other uh, languages that I didn't totally understand. The fact that sometimes people would assume I was local and just start prattling away. Um, I found that a bit uh, jarring and discombobulating at times, but overall, I think it was one of the experiences that I found fun and, and, and challenging and puts you on a much steeper growth curve that uh, lets you learn more, uh, more quickly, the life I was accustomed to back here, or I should say back in the US. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a little familiar with upstate New York, Rochester. Yes. What did your parents do? My father uh, was a periodontist, which is a d dental mm. uh, specialty. And my mother worked as a technology aide uh, in our local school system, our public school, school system, uh, helping teachers and students move into the modern era and work with computers and things like that. So I had a great childhood. I could go on and on about all the terrific times I had growing up there. We weren't, though, a family that did a lot of international travel. I think we went on some great family vacations domestically. My parents are probably a little bit surprised and confused and left shaking their heads about how their son grew up to uh, repeatedly live in other countries and repeatedly seemingly take harder paths than necessary <laughs> on several of these fronts, <laughs> whether that's start, starting companies in, in countries I don't know as well, or just the amount of uh, travel that we've undertaken. Mm. Isn't it amazing how parents never cease to have ideas of their own about what their children are going to do when they grow up? Yes, which I think is great. Yes. <laughs> it's fun. Have they visited you in India? Finally. So um, we'll probably get to this, but this is actually my second time living in India. Uh, the first time being a very uh, influential, powerful few years I, I spent uh, from 2006 to uh, early 2010. And uh, one of my big sadnesses was that they didn't visit me uh, on that, in that trip, in part because the, I think my parents felt that the flight was going, particularly my mother, I thought the flight was going to be very long and arduous, which it is. But I've convinced them to since make a trip. Uh, they came last year for, I guess, a couple of weeks. And we had a, a great time both in Mumbai and showing them around this mega city that I now call home, as well as going up to Rajasthan and seeing a bit of, of that part of the country as well. So I'm, mm. I'm 
I feel like it was a very important and, and, and powerful uh, experience for them to better understand this whole other world that I occupy over here that's been so important to my life. I'm really glad they, they made that trip. Oh, and how did they like it? I think they loved it, which was a, not a surprise exactly, but there were elements of the noise and the traffic and the honking and, and some other things that I thought would be a lot more jarring, um, just given the way that similar stimuli in the U.S. might be upsetting. But frankly, it's as if they occupied just a different mind space when they were here and things that probably would have been terrifying or upsetting in, if seen in the U.S., seem to be just part of the adventure. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get them back here again. Let's see. Oh, that's awesome. You know, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, there were two groups of people. One group, which sounds a lot like you and like I was, very adventuresome, accepted the culture for what it was and just loved the adventure and the travel. And then there were other people who got off the plane. I knew one dentist, actually, who got off the plane in Saudi Arabia well, it was a hot time, but of course, 11 and a half months a year, it's hot. It's over 100 degrees. And uh, they got off the plane and <laughs> stayed at the airport and waited for the next plane back to the U.S. Oh, my gosh. Okay. After all that orientation, said, oh, oh no, we gosh. can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It was like 120 wow. degrees. Very good for your parents. Even very seasoned travelers have a hard time in India sometimes. But perhaps yeah. it's changed a lot. And, and I do definitely want to get to this. Well, let's see. So was it before you went to law school that uh, this time from 2006 to 2010? After advertising, frankly, wasn't sure what I wanted to do and uh, was in a zone of taking a lot of the different grad school exams. I believe I took the GRE, the GMAT, the LSAT, was weighing a lot of possibilities. Uh, I think for a time I was most interested in and thought I would go and study philosophy at a graduate level because I had really enjoyed that in, in undergrad. Uh, what I ended up doing was opting for law school, partly because it felt like the right blend of practical and theoretical felt like I could get a little bit of my philosophy and theory and intellectual uh, side uh, indulged at the same time that still learning something practical that I could go off and get a real job uh, at the end of it. In some ways, the, the, I hate to admit this, the easiest one to apply to was a single essay. I had done well on the LSATs um, and it let me uh, bounce over and take three months in Southeast Asia the most easily. And so I applied to law school. I don't believe I ended up applying to any of the other grad schools and then flew off to Southeast Asia and spent a few months uh, backpacking around Thailand and uh, uh, Vietnam uh, and Cambodia, uh, which was terrific. So law mm. school was actually uh, the time that I started to discover this whole other world of uh, social enterprise and double bottom line businesses. Back then, I think social enterprise was still a relatively uncommon term, and mostly things were getting referred to as double bottom line businesses. Um, I and a group of students started uh, as, as a clinic. We, we were working on starting a community development bank, so a bank that was a real chartered bank, but one that would work uh, relatively neglected uh, populations of people, businesses, uh, nonprofits in the greater New Haven area. That was the first exposure I had to a, a business that was uh, trying to make money and really was trying to make money, but do it in a way that is actually creating positive change in, in the world. Um, it was also my first exposure to banking and financial services, which would become um, what I focused on for the better part of 12 years. And at that point, I knew nothing about balance sheets, nothing about banking, frankly, didn't find it very interesting. Uh, but once got once I got into it, I uh, realized there's there's all sorts of ways I could uh, amuse myself, things to learn, uh, and, and frankly, a practicality to financial services that I really enjoyed as I got into it. So it was after graduating from Yale with a law degree. Is that when you went back overseas then and, and started doing some microfinancing? Yeah, as soon as I took the bar exam, I made a trip to India to work with uh, SKS Microfinance. 
Um, and this was preceding uh, a relatively short stint, actually less than a year, at a corporate law firm in uh, the U.S., um, which I actually really enjoyed. But at this time of going to India, I, I had this dim sense that I probably wouldn't do corporate law for my life. I, I did think I would do it longer than I ended up doing it, but wanted to start building up experience and, and a network in some areas that could be interesting for post-law. And at that time, microfinance was just taking off. It was uh, 2005 was the year of microcredit with the UN. I believe that was the year that Muhammad Yunus, uh, who who's generally credited with starting microfinance, I believe that's the year he won the Nobel Prize. So this was becoming popular. And for me, I had really enjoyed this bank clinic and, and, and working on the startup of this bank. Um, this microfinance seemed like the inter, international backpacker version of community development banking and something that uh, I thought could be very interesting that had some narrative consistency and followed from my prior experience, but still a, a huge new adventure. I had spent a lot of time trying to apply to other microfinance institutions in the Western hemisphere. I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest, but I was writing to all of the big microfinance institutions in Latin America. Not surprisingly, no one, no one wrote me back uh, in part because I, I don't really speak Spanish. Uh, so that would have been incredibly challenging. I had a link to the founder of SKS through both McKinsey. Uh, we had both worked in the Chicago McKinsey office, uh, me just very briefly as a summer associate, and through my law firm um, with, called Mayor Brown, where they had been working with um, this founder in a pro bono capacity for some time. Had, had a unique in um, and even despite that unique in though, really had the campaign to let, uh, to, to convince him to let me join them. Um, and essentially, I remember after, after a few pestering phone calls and emails from partners at Mayor Brown and from myself, I think he kind of gave up and he said, look, I don't really like interns. I uh, don't really want you here, but if you want to, if you want to come and join, um, we're not going to give you any technology. We're not going to give you a, any, any desk space. Uh, I'm not really going to give you any guidance, but if, if, if you can come, if you can find out a way to add value, um, yeah, great, stick around. Um, otherwise, uh, I guess you can just treat this kind of like a vacation and they weren't going to pay me in any case. So that was a moot point anyway. So that was the context in which I boarded a plane to Hyderabad, India, uh, not really knowing anything about India. Uh, I actually look back and I'm shocked with uh, how excited and willing I was to go to a city I knew absolutely nothing about and landed there and I think had one or two nights in a relatively cheap hotel that I had paid for and then was just gonna see where things took me from there. Um, but that was the context of, of trip one. That was in 2006. You're boarding a plane, uh, going to India to work for a company in microfinance, which I want you to explain what that is in a second. You aren't gonna be paid and you've never been there before and it's halfway around the world. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, it's amazing. I think if I had been, uh, and, and people are, are much braver than me on this front, that's for sure. But I think part, part of what made that, that tolerable was the notion that I knew this would be for just a few months. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think you could do anything for a few months. And so for me at that moment, I had been so craving adventure. I had been so craving intellectual and physical distance from law school. Um, I mean, there were elements of law school I liked, but I would not generally say law school is one of my favorite three years mm. of my life or, or career. Um, and so this was a, a chance to get pretty far away from all of that. So mostly I was just excited about the newness, the experience. Um, at this point, I had also become quite a fanboy of microfinance. I had read every book I could find. I had written a pretty substantial third year law school paper on the financing of microfinance that had let me uh, use a curricular excuse to do all the reading I could and, and organizing my thinking on this. I don't even know if the comparison would be spending you know, years and years fantasizing about a basketball team or something and then getting to go hang out in the Boston Garden or mm. uh, uh, the United Center in Chicago or, or something like that. Well, I'm going to pause you right there because would you explain what microfinance is? 
Sure. I think microfinance uh, has, has evolved to mean a lot of different things. Um, it usually is synonymous with microcredit, which means uh, the practice, uh, and there's many, many different formats of this and whatnot, but high level, it's giving small loans to mostly women, but in any case, lower income, poor households, so that they can finance income generating activities uh, that would make their lives better and produce extra mm. cash flow. So by income generating activities, um, we would give loans, I guess KS would give loans uh, that might be $200 or so, sometimes, sometimes less, sometimes a little more, that would be used to go buy a goat or go buy inventory for a small roadside diner or a small Kirana shop or like a little mom and pop grocery store. A goat's a good example where um, once you've bought a goat, you get the benefit of the, the offspring and a cow example, you get the benefit of milk that you can sell every day. In the store context, uh, obviously, you're able to uh, maybe buy a bigger amount of inventory or make an expansion on the, on the store that would produce relatively quick cash flow benefits. So these are not functioning big formal businesses, of course. This is small livelihood activities, but that's how most people, particularly mm. in rural and semi-urban India, um, make money. And so I, I think it's a really powerful idea. Um, it has had problems and it has had increasingly critics um, on different fronts, but the idea in its, in its, uh, in its pure form, I still very much uh, believe is powerful, that uh, if people have something great to do with cash, and they can, with a small amount of cash, uh, make their lives better and still pay it back and move forward. It's, it's really a market failure not to uh, provide that kind of support. Mm. Of these small loans, how much do you think you lent out? So, um, uh, and, and, and you is a pretty expansive term here. At the time that I, I joined mm. SKS, I think there were already about 80 or 100 employees there were already, um, I think, over 100,000 um, customers. So it was already pretty big. Um, SKS, though, grew to be a massive company. By the time I left SKS, I believe it was around 7 million customers. And there were 20, 20 something like 25,000 employees. Uh, so the sums getting lent wow. out while in small quantums for each individual borrower, maybe 150 or $200, the total sums were massive. I believe, I, I, I'm probably rust, very rusty on the numbers, but I, I believe the balance sheet was, was, was close to, or maybe even um, over a uh, billion dollars by the time I left. Uh, my, my brain is a little bit fuzzy on this, but it's also, you, you have to keep in mind that these numbers are quoted in um, Indian lakhs and crores, um, a lakh being mm. 100,000 and a crore being 10 million. And, and so uh, as much as I, I know those for everyday uses, uh, when you start talking in really big numbers in like you know, 10 lakh crore, um, it often gets uh, confused because you're, you're converting both the language and the currency uh, conversion. In any case, if memory serves, and I'm doing my conversions right, I think it, I think it was around uh, you know, a billion dollars that the SKS portfolio would have been. It just really makes the hair stand up on my arms and everywhere to imagine that so many customers would benefit from these small loans. It seems counterintuitive based on yeah, your standards. I think it's an incredibly powerful idea. I, and I do mm. think that broadly it has worked more than a lot of academics would maybe say. I mean, there's been all mm -hmm. sorts of interesting controversies since. I do think it had its problems as well. Um, I think that while I was in India, the, the growth of microfinance uh, was really, really fast and, and companies growing uh, multiple times uh, over in, in a single year. I mean, I think SKS was growing something like 300% per year. I believe that mistakes were certainly made in terms of, of, of how this was administered at local levels. But yeah, I think broadly, the fact that microfinance showed how you can engage poor families as uh, market participants, not as subjects of charity, but as people who are being mm -hmm. offered a product or service and they pay back and they pay for that and they, they grow to expect better service and see themselves as agents of change in their own lives, I think was is it was a really powerful uh, development at scale. Mm, yes, absolutely. Is microfinance as popular in the U.S.? 
No, um, um, I think there's all sorts of books and articles written about why, but microfinance in the form that has been most broadly used in emerging markets, the group model or joint liability group model, uh, for a number of maybe cultural and other structural reasons, just really hasn't taken off uh, in the same way um, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, there is a, a thriving banking movement that I mean, a lot of great work has been done, and different people have experimented, but I, I think it's a bit different. There's certainly some things happening uh, that are pretty exciting in the U.S. as well. Mm. So you go over to India, expecting to stay just a couple of months as an intern. Did you come back to the U.S. or did you wind up just staying in India and working there? Yeah, I had made a commitment and was excited to return to work at uh, Mayor Brown, a a law firm uh, with global offices, but I was going to work in Chicago. Um, So after a few months returned there, um, my time at SKS was really incredible and eye-opening, had shown up not knowing what I might work on or where I might add value but coming off being a summer associate at a consulting firm where the primary thing I learned that summer was how to make PowerPoint slides. I found that I could uh, jump in and add value and have people want me around by simply making their slides and listening to them and converting their, their words and ideas into pretty decks that we could start to slot into business plans and share with investors and that sort of thing. So I found this interesting uh, little, little gap for myself um, where I could Uh, add some value, but very much learn um, who the different people were and how they fit and what the processes were, um, um, simply by in some ways being a a digital scribe for the the, the company. I did that for uh, a couple of months, had a great experience learning a broad base of the the SKS and business and microfinance in general, but then came back to switch gears quite substantially to move into real estate. uh, And Real mm-hmm. estate in the background had been this other angle I had been really excited about as a channel to create positive change and economic and community development in the world. I was really taken with a book called The Mystery of Capital by Fernando de Soto that talked about the ways that property rights and land rights systems, if properly constructed, could create capital where it's needed and could turn dead capital of undescribed land and and property into live capital that you could mortgage and then go do other stuff with. And I really wanted to learn, how does that happen? Like, how do you actually write these loan agreements and mortgage agreements and move pieces of the puzzle around and sell things to people and develop things? Um, So that was a whole separate area of interest and thought, frankly, I would do that for a few years. Had an actually terrific uh, and I, that's rare, I think, for first-year corporate lawyers. But a terrific experience, found a series of great mentors at uh, Mayor Brown, got to do a lot of interesting work um, there. Although ultimately, before the year, first year was up, the lure of India and SKS and microfinance proved too strong and uh, decided that it was a moment in history that I didn't want to miss. I could see how quickly things were changing and evolving uh, um, in Indian microfinance and made the the tough decision to take the major pay cut and go back to India for SKS. Mm. So they asked you to come back. Now they're wanting you to come back. (laughs) Yes, the the, the tables had turned just a little, which was great. Uh, I think that one of the things that I was able to work on both while I was in India the first time, but then even when I was back in Chicago, SKS at that time was raising significant money from um, venture capital investors. I was able to play a role initially in India, helping organize all of the materials and, and help make the presentations that we would give to uh, investors who were looking, at, looking to invest in SKS. So I really got to know the business well, got to know the process, got to know the uh, prospects uh, for future growth. That got me really excited. When I was back in Chicago, I and uh, a partner I became really close to, David Carpenter, were essentially the lawyers for SKS to manage the transaction as they raised money. So I found a way to stay pretty closely connected to the company even while I was back in Chicago. Once the money was in the door, it became a lot more possible to consider expanding the senior management team and um, gave me a chance to, to go back and uh, work with Vikram, the founder, and, and the whole team. How long did you stay with them once you went back? 
I was there for, um, I, I, it must have been a, another another couple of years, two and a half years maybe. Um, I uh, had a great job. In fact, in many ways, a dream job and, and one I still think of as one of the most exciting roles I have ever had and will ever have. One of the visions for SKS at that time was once we have all these relationships with uh, poor customers uh, around India, our ability to leverage this institutional relationship to provide a bunch of other stuff they need, whether that's education or healthcare or products and services, um, we really thought there was a huge opportunity here, uh, particularly because we were one of the only scaled uh, relationships that they had. Um, there were very few other uh, companies that had as consistent direct contact with these people and had developed the kind of trust that I think SKS had. So my job was to figure out what else should we do and how should we do it? And so had a, mm-hmm. had a decently sizable, I think about a 20 person team to go out and uh, experiment with a lot of these new ideas. So we, we did mobile banking experiments, distributed cell phones and water purifiers and solar lights and launched a chain of uh, schools for our borrowers' children and did different uh, distribution projects and really tried a lot of different things as well as more typical financial products like insurance and things like that. Um, But it was a really incredible role that that put me in the middle of, put my whole team in the middle of a lot of nascent BOP, basic pyramid entrepreneurial efforts happening in India. So we were in microfinance, but we we're getting to learn a lot about the energy needs of rural customers, the water uh, purification mm. challenges, the challenges of government schools and, and how private educational options could be beneficial, healthcare, uh, really across the board, the different constellation of concerns and challenges that our customers faced and how we could build business models or business lines off of the SKS platform to help them. That was really heady stuff. That was really exciting stuff for us to think about and really felt at that moment like SKS could become a truly iconic business and a, and a really massive opportunity to be the source of scale for all of these nascent ideas around um, solar and water and, and mobile telephony and, and healthcare and, and all the rest. Because I think at that time, there was a lot of businesses springing up, businesses that now have grown to some scale, um, like D-Light, who was a partner of ours, like the uh, Hinsan Unilever Purit water, fil- water filter. These were relatively new products at the time, searching for some way to get into customers' hands, and we could help make that happen. Mm, that is so awesome. I can hear the energy in your voice too. Did you actually go out into India to see a lot of the people who were recipients of the loans that you gave them? Yeah, of course. My team probably did uh, more of that in that they were running these pilots, often spending weeks at a time in a pilot spot, mm. but uh, definitely made many, many trips, have spent uh, many nights in in an SKS branch somewhere or, or just low-end motel some, some, somewhere in a small town um, trying to make these work. Uh, so it was, it was certainly full of, of a- a- adventures and, and surprises as, as we tried to, to grow these business lines. It's incredible. The last time I was in India was in the 80s. <laughs> so it's been a long time, way before the tech boom my mother loved to go to India, and it was easy for us to go there from Saudi Arabia. So I used to go a lot from the time I was little. But we would see so much poverty and disease. You would see elephantitis was very mm. common, begging. I think half of Mumbai was um, homeless at the time. And they were around, um, gosh, if I remember correctly, around 8 million. So wow. very congested and disturbing conditions, I guess I'll put it that way. So I am just so encouraged and so excited to hear about this microfinance. And I can't help but wonder if they had a a real impact on building the middle class in India. Yeah, I, I would I would love to say that was the case. My my suspicion is uh, microfinance has played some very small role, particularly in um, rural India. I think there have been a number of forces at work to really make India one of the most exciting growth stories of the last 
few years. Um, uh, in the early 90s, uh, India liberalized economically in ways that started to bring more um, capital and business. And I think that was the turning point in terms of uh, launching a much faster economic growth rate that, that started to create more uh, middle class uh, professional opportunities and things like that. Um, and, and, and frankly, something I continue to be struck by constantly is just how uh, uh, amazingly intelligent and entrepreneurial uh, everyone, I mean, not everyone, no, no one every, anywhere uh, across the board, but the, the entrepreneurial orientation and the intelligence here is just in, incredible. There is no doubt that if the, um, the right economic conditions could be put in place, that um, in India is going to uh, just continue, I think, to lead into the future. One of the things I've always kind of liked about India is the fact that it also is a country that's so um, confident and proud of itself that it doesn't uh, consistently kind of look back to the U.S. or look back to England or something to, to try to like see where it stands. It's got its very own unique uh, business culture and fashion style and way of talking and being that um, is its own thing. And there's a lot of pride in, in that. I can only imagine, I'm, I've, I of course only went to India the first time in 2006, and even in the last 12 years have seen so many changes uh, and so many way, ways in which these markets have evolved. Um, I can only imagine that the 80s would have been a totally, totally different experience. So you will have to come back and visit. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, that was going to be my, my next question is, what do you like most about it personally? Oh, that is a good question and difficult. I think India has become so much like home, uh, particularly in this last two and a half or two, two years of being here on this stint, but just ret like returning here with such irregularity. Uh, um, even since I moved back to the U.S. in 2010, I've been coming back here. Uh, every two or three months since. So it has become so much like home, it's almost difficult. But so, some of the things, particularly in Mumbai, the saturation uh, at all times of sights, of sounds, of smells, of people, of colors, um, it, it makes it such a vibrant place to be, kind of like the experience I have, uh, you know, when you're, when you're in New York, where there's just so many things to, to look at mm -hmm. and see and be inspired by. Having moved from Washington, D.C., I appreciate, but I wouldn't say it's my favorite city in the world. To be very honest, sometimes felt drab and uninspiring and colorless. Um, I just love that uh, just simply leaving the house each morning and, and, and taking my scooter into the office is its own adventure where I'm going to encounter so many different stimuli. So I really like that. The other thing I, I think I really like, as I'm, as I'm thinking, is, is just the way that the machinery of life and, and the mechanical underbelly of our existence is laid bare in, in a different kind of way. Um, I live right across the street from an auto garage that's been there for, I don't know, decades. Uh, and it's kind of just under some sort of stilted, corrugated tin roof. And I just kind of walk by it each day and or drive past by it each day. And, and, and you can just see them working on all of these cars or as you pass by sort of the, the markets, um, you see the people fixing shoes. You see the people fixing luggage. Um, iPhone uh, repairs are done like right in front of your face. It gives an appreciation for all of the magic that happens in our lives that I think you kind of can easily take for granted because a lot of this stuff that happens behind sterilized doors and you don't mm. know what exists and just magically, oh, there's my iPhone. It's perfect. That's wonderful. Here, I, I feel like across a lot of different areas, uh, it, it, India can teach gratitude in, in, a, in a really unique way that uh, I think is powerful. And, and certainly, uh, I, I enjoy kind of waking up here each day and, and being out in the, in the midst of all this life uh, every day. That reminds me when you talked about gratitude. In the U.S., of course, mindfulness and meditation and practicing gratitude are practices that are more mainstream now than they were in the 60s when I first learned about them. How separate are these practices from a person's life in India versus hmm. the United States? And what I mean by that is it seems like we have to go off to a retreat somewhere to practice meditation or mindfulness. Is, that, is it the same in India? 
It's always very hard to generalize on these topics. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes India gets this stereotype that it's, it's, it's in some ways like got this like every, every, everyone namaste all the time or something. And I don't, that is, that is not true and not a great characterization. I do think that spirituality, whether, whether it's Hinduism or uh, uh, Buddhism or um, Islam or, uh, or just uh, your own private uh, meditation practice or a guru that you follow, I, I do feel like it's probably more prevalent and present and visible here. Um, it's more common, at least in my experience, to go into households that will have uh, areas uh, set up for puja or, or like a prayer area, mm-hmm. um, more common to have art on the walls also something that I think people care about and think about and talk about in, in day-to-day life. And that was always something that I've appreciated. In the mm-hmm. U.S., I feel like it's always considered something very separate, not something you really bring up in a business meeting or something mm-hmm. like your meditation practice. And that's changing, I think, in certain pockets. Um, certainly where, where, where you stay in, in, on the West Coast, I think there's been a bit of a revival or movement towards that I can tell towards more deeper being in touch with the spiritual side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's always been there here. And, and, and I like that. I also think that um, it's something that at least in our case, in my company now, uh, this is something that we take very seriously and that we care about. Um, uh, and by this, I mean, uh, being in touch with uh, yourself and the benefits of mindfulness and putting yourself in the right state to be your best self and right state being uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, so that you can do your best work and, and be the best person you can be. My co-founder, Matt, who actually is based in San Francisco, has been a big proponent of bringing mindfulness and self-awareness uh, into um, our business and into our culture as a, as a company at Shortlist, where I am now. Uh, and he has uh, himself been through so many formative experiences, different workshops, coaching experiences, and he's, he's done a great job of trying to bring, consolidate and organize and um, summarize those and bring those practices into our company. Um, it's not entirely unusual. I, our, our, our Nairobi team has a Wellness Wednesday where they go out and uh, do some yoga, uh, meditate each Wednesday. Our Bombay office actually has a room that's called the Meditation Room. I don't think it's as used for meditation as much as it once was, but um, there have still been at different times moments where the team will kind of sit together for 10, 15 minutes um, on silently. Um, we, we use journaling a lot and even strategic uh, retreats to try to promote individual grappling with challenges and questions that our business is facing. Um, so I know your, your question probably started somewhere else, but it ended somewhere else. But I, I do think it's the practice around mindfulness and, and spirituality, self-awareness are, are things that um, we as a company, more so uh, than just like impressions of the overall country, something we've taken very seriously. Mm, yes, thank you. No, that's perfect. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and how this all started. So now I uh, um, have made a crazy leap from uh, my more recent stint in Washington, D.C. to move to India and start a company in a totally different field than microfinance. After I was at SKS, I returned to the U.S., did a few other things as a consultant, but then set up an impact investing fund um, called Axion Venture Lab. So uh, this was a small seed fund that was a pool of money allocated by a nonprofit called Axiom, um, which is a very big company, like uh, has had a balance sheet of $350 million and had invested in and supported microfinance institutions for a long time. They gave me a small pool of money to build a team and invest in innovative financial inclusion startups around the world. Um, This was back in 2011. 2012 when we actually launched and the uh, that moment was a really exciting one where there was a lot of new ideas in how financial services could be done a lot of technology entering in terms of how we did payments how we could analyze underwrite distribute credit products uh, how we could engage financial service customers in different ways. Um, There was all this stuff happening uh, and startups were at the forefront of this. 
uh, wave of innovation. Unfortunately, many of them weren't getting the funding they wanted because in emerging markets, there's not the same well-developed venture capital in the ecosystem, angel investing ecosystem. So my fund was set up to support the uh, most innovative of these companies, particularly in emerging market innovation hotspots like India, Kenya, we don't work in Mexico, um, as well as uh, some investing in the US as well. So I did that actually for five years, uh, mostly mm. based in Washington, DC. During that time, uh, I started to realize a few things. One, I just realized personally that um, one of the parts of my professional life that I enjoyed the most was helping people find their best careers and best, best selves in the world. And um, would rarely turn down doing an informational interview or offering any help I could to people looking to find jobs uh, in the impact investing or social enterprise world. I know how fortunate and grateful I was that I had found certain people that took a chance on me early and wanted to return that favor. Mm. I also was, was teaching classes um, to people transitioning from mainstream careers uh, into social enterprise or impact investing. Um, I was particularly teaching classes around impact investing and how to make seed investments and things like that. Really enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed building my teams at Venture Lab and, and other places. It was something I took great pride in getting the right people together, setting the right cultural tone, values, et cetera. So I had always been really excited about building teams and helping people find their way and unlock their potential. Um, at the same time, all the companies I was investing in were having a lot of trouble building their teams and hiring the right people. Uh, I think we, uh, my co-founder Simon and I, Simon had been investing in clean energy startups at Shell Foundation. Both of us realized that once we had given these companies money, the biggest problem became people and finding the right people and, and training the right people and getting the human capital foundation of their business in a place where they could grow uh, responsibly. We initially thought we would just maybe um, invest in a company or partner with a company that we trusted that was using technology to build teams better. And as we got into it, we really couldn't find the right partner. And we saw such big opportunity to think about how tech could make uh, make it easier for companies to build teams. We started shortlist um, with a couple of different problems that we wanted to address um, and our problem statements. One was, you know, how can we use technology to bring more efficiency to this process of how um, companies hire people? Specifically, how can we automate some of these manual intensive processes around posting jobs to job boards, reviewing often thousands of CVs, uh, which you can you can just imagine uh, um, CVs in India can sometimes be six, seven, 10 pages long. Mm. Trying to make sense of a thousand of those and make a smart decision is just crazy. Making you know dozens or even hundreds of screening phone calls. How can we use tech to reduce all of that? And perhaps more importantly on the, on the quality side, how can we use tech to see past these incomplete misleading CVs? I think one of the things we realized is particularly for relatively young entry level or junior job candidates, their CVs are very bad proxies for how good they might be in the job. And in fact, while experience might matter somewhat, oftentimes motivation and potential can mm -hmm. matter more. And so we built a short list initially as a platform to try to make it far easier for companies to streamline their recruiting processes, but also to get past the CV in their hiring decisions by utilizing a bunch of both insights as to how interested the, the, jo the job seeker and candidate is in their role as an indicator of motivation, but very much relying on a philosophy of show us what you can do and creating different digital challenges or work simulations that candidates can go through to actually show that they, that they know how to do the things the job will require, that they have some of the knowledge that the job would require. So regardless of what your experience says, if you can do the stuff, great, you should probably get an interview and we should facilitate that. Um, so Shortlist started on that basis of how can we make it a lot easier uh, and cheaper to build great teams. Um, and hire great teams. I think as we think about the, the project of Shortlist into the future, there's just so many different things we'd like to be able to help companies with related to building great teams, training those teams, 
uh, instilling the right uh, culture and, and values and using uh, better company practices as a way to unlock a broader base of professional potential um, in these markets um, we work in. So we are now a company that um, works uh, across India and Kenya. We're approaching 60 full-time employees, which is crazy for me to think about. Um, it's been an incredible two and a half year uh, journey. We've worked with about 150 companies and uh, I feel like we're just at a point where we're starting to grow more quickly and build the kinds of relationships with companies and with job seekers that uh, will, will make the future much more, even much more exciting than, than where we're at today. That is very exciting. Let me just clarify a couple of things. Are the candidates from India and Kenya and you're matching them with with companies right. in their countries? Yeah, that's right. And I should I should say it's just a fascinating moment right now demographically. In India there are there are over a million people joining the job market each month. Um, mm. new people joining the workforce. That is an incredible amount. In Africa, broadly, not just Kenya, but across Africa, there are more people joining the, the workforce in the next 10 years than the rest of the world combined. And if you think about that for a minute, that's including India, China, uh, you know, North America doesn't even blip on that spectrum. So mm -hmm. when you think about the flood of raw talent, and I think we very much believe that uh, talent is evenly distributed, opportunity is not. If you take that seriously, it means that there are just a ton of young people that are going to be looking for opportunities um, to make themselves better, looking for opportunities to find uh, meaningful employment. And we hope a ton of opportunities if the talent base is in place for companies to start moving into Africa and India, and more importantly, getting started here. And so I think it's an exciting moment to be thinking about how do we upscale, how do we inspire, how do we match all of these young people with opportunities. And it's obviously, I wish I could say it was an easy challenge to work on. There's dimensions of this that are political and, and socioeconomic and uh, industrial that you know, we can't address, at least not yet, as short lists. There's a lot of things that need to work in terms of um, creating those jobs and industry moving in at the right times in the right ways. It's by no means an easy challenge, but I know we're excited to do what we can to help companies find the right people and start working more and more with job seekers at scale in helping them be the best versions of themselves, find the, the jobs that uh, make sense for them learn about what's out there, which I think is often a big problem as people are just not exposed to the different uh, career pathways that could exist and provide the tools that we can to, to make all this happen, promote self-awareness and go have great careers. That is very exciting. One of the things that we hear a lot in the U.S. is that there is a war of talent, that there's a, a shortage of talent. But what I'm hearing you say is just the opposite. In India and <clears throat> Africa, there is a plethora of talent. There's a plethora of raw talent. I mean, it, it's just truly exciting. I do think there is a, a significant challenge of taking this raw talent. And uh, I don't know if you call it upskilling or, or what, but I think that there are a lot of people that haven't had the benefit of terrific educational experiences that leave them ready for the modern workforce. So I do think that there's big, big opportunities to take this raw talent and make it kind of more fit for some of the opportunities that are out there. But absolutely, the quantum of smart, motivated, hungry individuals that we see and that are coming into these markets is inspiring and exciting. Is that one of the reasons why you joined with Spire Education? to be able to provide that kind of training and mentoring? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Absolutely. We acquired a company late in 2017. It's kind of unusual for a startup at our stage, but um, it's a company that we felt a, a deep values and cultural alignment with that had been working for several years developing really great content around young professional soft skills, soft skills being mindsets and communication and teamwork and uh, empathy and 
the different ways that young professionals need to interact and communicate in professional environments. They exist today as more of a corporate training business, and that's great. And we like being able to work with companies as they help build teams. We're also excited, though, to figure out the right ways to open up this content and these learning opportunities to a broader set of our uh, job seeker base. I mean, we now have um, hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, job seekers that have, have come to shortlist, applied to jobs on shortlist, interacted. Um, we'd like to start creating um, the right mix of digital and non-digital content and training opportunities so that more than just giving them a chance to apply for a job, we're actually creating the opportunity for more value uh, for them, uh, more learning opportunities for them. Choir Inspire, which we're now folded into Shortlist and is now Shortlist Training, we've got big plans for that direction and starting to think a lot more about how we can play a bigger role adding value to job seekers' lives. That's awesome. Yes, and I, I will put a link to Spire and also to Shortlist in the uh, show notes. For the, um, the North American and the European that's intrigued with the opportunities in India and, and uh, Africa, what advice do you have for them? Well, uh, if people are looking to make a switch, whether it's to something in social enterprise or, or making a move geographically coming to these markets, I think you've just got to do it. It would have never worked, I, I realize now, if I had sat in the U.S. and sent really thoughtful emails and sent lots of you know, resumes. And I think a huge number of my friends had a similar experience. The way to really get here is to just fly here. Uh, and the people that seem to have made it work, particularly if you are an expat, you are foreign, pack a suitcase, buy a one-way ticket, show up here, help people be confident that you are serious and that you're not just kind of looking at this as a travel adventure opportunity and that you're here to stay. And I do think that there are still a lot of opportunities across a lot of different fields for smart people to come and learn about a sector and contribute value. I think the answer is just get here and figure it out. How hard is it to get a work visa in Africa or India? <laughs> it can be tricky, but been so far uh, relatively lucky uh, on that front. But um, nor normally, people can sort that out, so it's not a it's not a barrier to entry. Mm, okay, that's great. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've had as an expat living in India and traveling to Africa? Or Kenya? You know, it's um, uh, it's it's been a fascinating experience building a business in two very different markets. In some ways, India and Kenya are only as far apart from each other geographically as New York and San Francisco. But culturally and it's just general context and climate and uh, everything else, it's, they're, they're, they're obviously very different um, places. We started our business in both countries around the same time initially ran them very similarly um, as we were just getting the very basics of our business and technology platform built. Uh, I do think we're, we've now very much entered a phase where the businesses are run more autonomously and we've freed up uh, local managing directors in each country to drive the local uh, strategy and, and adaptation and um, client relationships and the rest. But no question, uh, building a business in two markets has posed many challenges, certainly different ways that uh, business is done in the two markets, um, different approaches to talent. Also, just very much, frankly, uh, on, on the practicalities of business, of market context, competitive landscape. For example, India is a market that has very likely hundreds of thousands of small recruitment agencies that go around chasing mandates. Um, vast majority of them are subscale or tech backward. But in Bombay alone, I've seen estimates, uh, I mean, in the city I live in, I've seen estimates that there might be 10,000 up to upwards of 50,000 um, recruitment agencies. As a business that offers recruitment services um, in India, it's, it's a noisy landscape that we have to fit into. Um, um, we have to 
figure out ways to differentiate and be viewed as special and build relationships that aren't just about um, racing to the bottom on, on pricing or, or something like that. Whereas in Kenya, it's a totally different context. There isn't the same profusion of uh, small scale recruitment agencies. There are certainly a few, but, but we're entering a landscape where um, companies are just learning uh, how they might work with uh, third party providers to help out in, in this talent area. They're, they're, they're in some ways, it's because it's new, maybe more open to um, ideas and how they could do it better. And that is just one of a thousand different dimensions that, that needs necessitates a different approach uh, in each market. Mm. Yeah, those are uh, great examples. And what about language? In India, do you find that people speak English and in Africa as well? Absolutely. Um, um, and I would have a really hard time working here in both India and Kenya, um, at least as far as um, the like business environment uh, is concerned. Uh, English is the primary language um, used and uh, it, it is the language everyone's speaking. I have also done work in, for example, Mexico, where most of the people uh, uh, do speak English, but there's no question that business is primarily done in Spanish, and it would be an extreme accommodation for people to speak English in a, in a meeting. That's not the case here. Everyone's, everyone's doing business in English, and um, that's why we felt comfortable setting up this business here. And as we expand, we'll be going to other markets that uh, also have a foundation of English, in part because it's also just easier for our tech platform to fit without any significant uh, linguistic customization, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, et cetera. Uh, but no, language has been uh, not an issue. That said, I think my, my co-founder Simon and I both, both wish we, we spoke more of both Hindi or other local languages and Swahili. Um, it's something we continue to say. We should probably learn one or both. Running a startup just continues to be so busy that we never quite have the intellectual time or space that we would like to do that. Because I do think as much as we're able to get around and function and 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 run our business, I know we're missing out on elements of the experience of living here that I think we'd really enjoy if we had a fuller range of communication tools. There are certainly people in both markets that we're not able to speak to the way we would like. Um, because we don't have the language tools. I, I hope someday uh, that is something we have a little bit more brain space to work on. Oh, thank you. This has been fascinating. I so appreciate all the information and I'm sure I'm, I've got a, enough questions to go for another hour, but I'm not going to keep <laughs> you another hour. I just so appreciate all that you've uh, shared with us. It's so fascinating. And I do want to come and visit. Uh, you know, I interviewed a uh, Sonartis. He lives in Jakarta. He said the same thing about English, that actually in the mm -hmm. schools they te teach English, and his children don't even speak Indonesian. So, oh, my gosh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 yeah, I think uh, that's similar in these, in these markets. Uh, many of the schools are English medium. For many people, uh, particularly many of my friends who are Indian here, uh, they are far, far more comfortable in English than they would be in Hindi. They can kind of speak Hindi to their drivers or, or something like that, but uh, would feel far more comfortable having a complex conversation in English oh, than, than not. That is, that's just so interesting. I guess I'm going to leave you with one last question. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew earlier? Hmm. That's a, it's a great question. Uh, and I know it's the kind of question that as I think about it, mull it over over the next day or so, there will probably be 25 things I uh, wish I had thought of. I, I think maybe, and this is probably just part of, part of uh, continuing to grow up, uh, appreciating and understanding what what are the memories that matter, what are the experiences that matter. I feel lucky that I have been able to have a huge range of experiences, developed a huge range of friendships that I don't think I could have anticipated, say, age 21. When I was 21, looking ahead to, um, I, I recently celebrated a 40th birthday, it's a milestone birthday, you, you, you reflect a bit. As I think about being 20, looking ahead to 40, uh, I had certain notions of what success would look like 
uh, been a wife, a family, a big house, uh, a very successful career, probably would have pictured myself in some corporate hierarchy. And at 21, that was kind of the, the world I was working with. Obviously, my life has, has turned out different, but I feel really blessed and I'm full of gratitude that I've had this huge range of experiences um, that I wouldn't have anticipated, but that have created and defined a new version of success for myself. Uh, and that makes me really excited. Still, I think uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, as I reflect about what experiences have mattered, what moments, friendships, I think sometimes I, I like everyone, I think can get lost in the day-to-day -day mm. pressures, needing to finish you know, an email and make it much better and not taking the time to call a friend or not taking the time to go on a vacation or create those kinds of experiences that will be the lasting treasured uh, memories. I think maybe um, a slightly better perspective uh, and passing more of uh, my decision making through that filter of what's really going to matter in a five to 10 year period and living based on that a little bit more so than, um, gosh, what feels most urgent and pressing right this minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's great. I just read a great book on writing a memoir. I had a friend uh, recently publish a memoir and she was telling me, I would urge every person alive to write their own memoir. Assume you're never going to publish it, but almost as a, as a process, uh, an exercise of trying to remember and organize and form thoughts and points of view. I'm a long way from being able to uh, invest the kind of mental energy that that would require for myself, but I like the idea. Yes. The point of a memoir is to remember through your five senses experiences. I have a very poor memory. <laughs> I don't remember, <laughs> but my sister has a very clear memory. She'll remember things of when we were six and seven years old just as an example, wow. so to keep a journal, I'm like, okay, I kept journals, but I used to throw them away. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, did you read uh, the book Shantaram? I have, yes. Oh, fascinating. And yeah, his fascinating. memory, oh, he, it's so good. I'm going to put that in the show notes too. He also wrote a second book that um, my husband just finished. And oh, he, really? Yes. And it's just as good as the first one and just as long. It's like 900 pages. My co-founder, Simon, has a copy of that. So based on that recommendation, perhaps I'll actually pick it up and see what the sequel looks like. Yes. Oh, really good. But his ability to recall the yes, senses and incredible. the smells and is quite amazing. Well, thank you so much. I have so enjoyed meeting you. And I will take you up on the offer to come and visit you in Africa, I mean, in, in uh, India. We, we, we live in both. That is so awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I do appreciate the time that you've spent with us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Cinder. I'm Cinder Niemela, and you've been listening to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We hope these conversations illuminate your path to your highest potential. For show notes and links to resources mentioned during today's episode, please go to inspiredwisdom.us. You can also follow Inspired Wisdom on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, design a fulfilling and prosperous life that engages your talents and passions.